And just as we're kind of transitioning into the Word, I did, I caught this just on the radio this morning coming to church, and then Pastor Paul kind of gave me some more of the details, but I guess there was a, a terrible attack in Sri Lanka this morning, and it's clearly a, um, a coordinated attack, as there were many churches and other public places that were all bombed at the same time. And exactly what the what all has happened, I'm not sure. I just know that much for sure, though. Uh, we actually have uh, a brother here in our church from Sri Lanka, and I think he's here this, this morning. And uh, we want to pray for our brothers. At Fabrice, is that the... Nasha. Donisha. Donisha, our brother that's here this morning. Where are you, Donisha? Let me raise your hand. There you are, over there. We want to pray for you this morning and for your country. And... It's one of those things that we face on earth, isn't it? It's, it's terrible, it's, it's dark, it's sinful, it's evil, and yet it will not overcome the truth. It will not overcome Jesus because he is risen from the dead. And so this morning we're going to, to celebrate that truth together, but at the same time it will be good for us to pray for people there as well as for our brothers and sisters that God will give them the strength, the grace that they're going to need uh, to, to find their hope in the resurrected Christ. So just join me in prayer, please, as we, as we remember them. Father, it's been a great celebration for us here this morning, and, and in truth, Jesus is alive. He's risen. The tomb is empty. And Father, that means so much to us as, as Christians. And Father, uh, we want to continue to look at your word and to see what the resurrected Christ means to each of us. And yet now, Lord, we just want to pray for Sri Lanka and for our brothers, our sisters there. Lord, really for all the people who, whose lives, God, have been so, um, so horribly turned upside down today. God, we don't want to minimize that grief and that pain and that suffering. And so, God, we just pray your grace to comfort. We pray, Father, that in the midst of all of that, that the beauty, the light, the glory of Christ would shine. And so, Father, please do what just seems impossible to us. Bring beauty from ashes. We know that nothing will prevail against Christ, not even the gates of hell. And so, Lord God, Lord God, this morning we just pray your grace upon them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this morning we're in Luke chapter 24. You know that all the gospel writers write an account about the resurrection. And this morning we're just going to read part of one, which is in Luke 24. So I invite you to look at Luke 24, and I'm going to read, first of all, verses 1 through 12. And then I'm going to skip and read verses 36 through 49. But follow along in the Word of God as I read. This is Luke chapter 24 and beginning in verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not, see, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them as an idle tale. They did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. Now verse 36. 
And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet? It is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word this morning. Maybe sometime today you could take time to read the other gospel accounts of the resurrection you'll see that they have uh, some different details. They're not details that contradict the other, but they have different perspectives in which they see the events of the resurrection. And yet all of the gospel writers would agree on these three things. And, And this is the point of what the gospel writers are wanting us to understand about the resurrection and the events of that day. These three things all of the gospel writers want us to understand, and that is this. First of all, the resurrection was unexpected. It was unexpected by everyone. Now, we're going to talk more about each one of these points, but it was clearly unexpected. Maybe you got that as we read the scripture this morning. Number two, the resurrection was not only unexpected, it was unbelieved. That's a made-up word, by the way. You'll forgive me this once, won't you? (laughs) Probably disbelieved would be the actual word, but it fits better with the outline. Uh, It was unbelieved. Even after they saw him, they still did not believe. The gospel writers, all four of them, want us to see the resurrection was unexpected. And they want us to see that the resurrection at first was not believed. It was unbelieved even by his closest disciples. But there's a third thing. And all the gospel writers want us to see this. They say different things to underscore how true this is, and that is the resurrection became to all of them undeniable. It's unexpected. It was unbelieved at first, but it became undeniable to all of them, and it changed everything. It changed everything. Now, let's unpack those three together. First of all, let's think about the resurrection being unexpected. It's not that it should have been unexpected because Jesus himself had said on many occasions that he was going to be delivered to the hands of sinful men who were going to, who were going to kill him, and then on the third day he would rise again. I mean, he had laid it all out several times to them before. In your notes, if you have them, I have all the references from the different Gospels where Jesus had told of his coming death. Even if they would have known the Old Testament, If they had been reading it with believing, understanding eyes, they would have known that Psalm 16 was all about the resurrection. So it's not that it should have been unexpected, but it clearly was unexpected. It was unexpected by the ladies that came to the tomb that morning. What did Luke say they were coming to do? They were coming with spices. Now, why are they coming on the third day, this Sunday morning, with spices for the body? Well, because they're coming to help offset the, uh, the odors of decomposition. That's what they're doing. And so as they're, as they're coming to do it, you don't do that because you're expecting resurrection. You do that because you're expecting to find a dead body that is going to begin decomposition, and you're coming to try to offset the effects of that. The women were not expecting it when they came that morning. They were shocked when they saw 
the stone rolled away. They were shocked when they saw the tomb was empty. In John's gospel, it even tells us that John, um, in John's gospel, it says that Mary uh, sees one that she thinks is the gardener. Actually, it's the Lord Jesus himself, but she thinks it's the gardener at first, and she accuses him of taking the body. What have you done? They were not expecting resurrection. The disciples clearly were not expecting resurrection. They were were more than just mourning the crucifixion. They were in shock. You can almost see them with their faces buried in their hands in absolute bewilderment. Remember when Jesus in Luke 24, the part that we, we skipped over this morning, but when you read that, you'll see Jesus appears to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they, they speak for all of Jesus' followers and why it is that they were so bewildered and, and so, uh, so grief-stricken. He said this, this about Jesus. He was the one we had hoped who would redeem Israel. See, they were thinking he was going to bring the freedom from the Roman oppression. That's why their hopes were set up on, on him. And that's why they're so devastated when they see the way he's treated at the Roman authorities, at the hands of, of the Romans, that they're so, they're so shocked. They, they, they don't know what to make of it. Even the enemies of Jesus, in sort of an ironic twist, it's only the enemies of Jesus that remember what Jesus said, on three days he'll rise again. And so they take a they, they hire a Roman legion to stand, or a Roman guard, cohort, to stand around the tomb to guard it to make sure nobody comes and steals the body. No one was expecting resurrection. You could study the day and find that there was no major worldview that made room for a resurrection. The Greeks certainly did not believe in the resurrection. That was the predominant worldview. They believed the body was evil. They believed that ultimate salvation was getting rid of the body. No one was thinking resurrection. Clearly, it was unexpected. Along with that, then, at first it was unbelieved, even by Jesus' closest disciples. In the words that we read this morning, Luke 24, verse 11, these words seemed to them as an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Again, if you have your notes, you can see I made references there to all of the, all of the, the, uh, words that the, go- that the gospel writers write to show the unbelief of the disciples. Now, I want to step back and I want to ask this question. Very, very important question to ask and to answer. And the question I want to ask is why? Why do the gospel writers want us to see that the resurrection was unexpected and that at first it was unbelieved. Why are they so insistent that we get that? Why do they say things over and over again in their gospel records that it was unexpected and unbelieved? Why is that? Here's the answer. It was to underscore the third point. It was to highlight the third point. It was to give context so that this third point, it's like in neon lights. It's like up on top of the mountain, blinking in red letters. Because while at first it was unexpected and it was unbelieved, it became undeniable. Jesus was risen from the dead. And that this resurrection was a real, literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's almost like the gospel writers anticipated 2,000 years of the myths and of the downright lies that would be said about Jesus. Even today, you'll, you'll hear people say things like, well, the disciples really loved Jesus. The disciples really had their hopes pinned on Jesus. And after Jesus was, was killed, after Jesus was, was no more, with them. They'd loved him. They'd been with him for three years. They, they started to have dreams about Jesus. You know how that is. The, you know, you can imagine that, how that could happen. They start having dreams about Jesus, and, and they start talking to each other. They say, hey, I dream about Jesus. And, then, and another one's like, well, I had a dream about Jesus as well. So they started talking about their dreams about Jesus, and eventually they started to write these stories down about the things that they had dreamed, about the things that they had imagined about Jesus. 
So it is said even today by many, they'll say, the resurrection wasn't a real physical resurrection. It's not a big deal that the resurrection didn't happen. It was just, it just happened in their dreams, and it just became kind of a, a great story to live by. And that's how the resurrection is explained. And it's like the gospel writers anticipating those kinds of lies show us this resurrection was unexpected. No one was looking for it. There was no major worldview at the time that made room for it. This resurrection was at first unbelieved, even by his closest disciples. But then they, they believed what was undeniable, that Jesus was risen, literally, physically, and this resurrection is what changed everything. Quickly, let's just look at some of the evidence that the resurrection was undeniable, that the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus was undeniable. According to Matthew, as the women were going to tell the disciples that Jesus had risen, that they met Jesus. We see John talks about Mary meeting him, thinking she was the gardener at first. And Matthew says that she fell at his feet and took hold of him. You can't take hold of a vision, a dream. She falls and actually takes hold of his feet. That's an important detail. Just like according to Luke, when Jesus is walking with those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he stays with them. He takes bread with them and eats with them. It's really interesting that in Luke, he makes a connection between the disciples finally believing that Jesus is raised and eating with Jesus. There's something about that fellowship that is the time in which it's revealed to them this is Jesus alive and real. Luke also gives us the detail that when Jesus is talking, and we read this this morning in, in uh, verses 37 and 38, that later when he appeared to his disciples, they thought he's a ghost. They thought he's a spirit. And he says, don't be afraid. And remember what he said? See my hands, see my feet. It is I myself. And then to underscore it even more, he says, do you have anything to eat? And they bring him broiled fish, or boiled fish, and he eats with them. A ghost doesn't eat. A ghost, Jesus says, doesn't have flesh and bones. This is really, truly me. John says many of the same things as well as Mark. The point is, all the gospel writers are telling us they saw him, they touched him, they ate with him, they heard the words that he spoke. And while at first they didn't expect it, even at first they didn't believe it, it became undeniable to them Jesus had risen from the dead, the tomb was empty, he was alive. It's undeniable. I think it's... um, John Adams, the second president of the United States, who is accredited with this saying, facts are a stubborn thing. You know, maybe to you, the fact of the resurrection is kind of a stubborn thing. Maybe by God's grace, you've come to believe it, to receive it. There's joy in your heart this morning because Jesus Christ is alive and the tomb is empty. But maybe for you, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is still kind of a stubborn thing. And I would just try to say to you this morning, and and want to say this as kindly as I could, but also as seriously as I could, it's a fact that you must reckon with. It's a fact you must come face to face with. This Jesus Christ is risen. And if he's risen from the dead, he is Lord. And we're going to talk about the hope that that means and the hope that that brings to Christians. But wanting you to see this morning how the empty tomb changed everything. It changed everything. Maybe you're a historian and you would know about this story. You know when we talk about Napoleon meeting his Waterloo, you probably understand what that means. The year was, was 1815, June 18th to be exact. And Napoleon was, was marching across Western Europe. It was believed that he was about to conquer Western Europe. And so there was a coalition of forces that met him outside a village in Belgium uh, named Waterloo. And the fighting was fierce on that day. But at the end of the day, news of the battle was communicated back to the British Isle. 
And communication was made across the English Channel with signalers with flags and spotters with telescope. And so near the end of the day, the, the spotter on the English side with his telescope looked across at the signaler with his flags and received this message. Wellington, the Duke of Wellington, had to be a nice guy, Wellington, who was the commander of the coalition forces, defeated. Wellington defeated. And as soon as he spoke those words, the people who were there collectively moaned in anguish. They knew what this meant. They knew their freedom. They knew their way of life. They knew their country was quite possibly over. And there was a collective wailing as the message, Wellington defeated. But then there was a third word. As the spotter looked across to the signaler, the third word came across, Napoleon. That word changed everything. Wellington defeated Napoleon. Think about it this way. The disciples on that Friday, and you know the Friday I'm talking about, on that Friday when the one who they had hoped would liberate them, the one they believed to be the Christ, the one they had seen people worshiping, putting palm branches down in front of him as he rode into Jerusalem just five days before, they saw gruesomely crucified. And they are in utter shock and confusion and anguish. Jesus defeated But on that third day, they got the rest of the message. Jesus defeated death. And that changed everything. That changed everything. They went from despair and agony to confidence and hope. And they all went out throughout the world preaching the message of a Christ who died for sins and who was raised from the dead. And every single one of them gave their lives as a martyr for the truth and the reality of what was undeniable. Jesus Christ was risen. And there is repentance and forgiveness of sins through him. There is reconciliation to the God of heaven through this risen Christ. John, we believe, died of old age, but even John was in captivity when he died. All of them martyrs for the reality of a risen Christ. One of them was Peter. And Peter wrote these words, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter understood it clearly. This is a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This morning, let me give to you Five hopes every Christian has because of the resurrection. Five hopes that every Christian has because of the resurrection. Number one, the resurrection gives you hope because all the Bible is trustworthy. It gives you hope that all the Bible is trustworthy. Just quickly, this is how it goes. The resurrection of Jesus was foretold in the Old Testament, specifically places like Psalm 16. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 writes that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Listen, the only scriptures he can be talking about is the Old Testament scriptures. Most of the gospel writers weren't even completed by that time. He's only talking about the Old Testament scriptures. And according to the Old Testament scriptures, he would die and be raised. Jesus said to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Don't you know the scripture said that the Christ would suffer before he entered into his glory? Even what the angel said, he is risen as he said. Jesus foretold his own resurrection. You know, I often hear people say something like this, and you may be one of them. I often hear people say something like, who should I really believe? Who should I really 
place my trust and my faith in. There's so many options out there. There's so many voices out there. There's, there's Buddhism. There's Hinduism. There's Islam. There's even secularism. There's, there's all kinds of, of different uh, pagan ideas. Who in the world should I believe? And I would encourage you to believe the one who not only foretold his own resurrection, but who was actually undeniably raised from the dead. There's no other faith that claims that their Savior and Redeemer is raised from the dead. Believe in that one. Believe in that one. A good friend of mine years ago, he was a good good guy. I enjoyed him as, as a friend. He's a very smart guy. He was a doctor. Very good one. And uh, he did not believe in Jesus. Matter of fact, he, he would call himself an agnostic, which means I'm not really an atheist because there's probably something out there. I just don't know what it is. So he claimed to be an agnostic. And so he was willing to study the Bible, though. He wanted to, to know more about Christianity. And so uh, we, we had many times together where we were talking about the claims of Christ and and the gospel. Jesus died for our sins, that he rose from the grave to bring us to God. And I'd give him some books to read, and we would kind of go back and forth on that, but I'll never forget the time he told me this. He said, I've come to the conclusion that if the resurrection happened, then it's all true. It's all true, because he reasoned this way. If the resurrected happened, the reason that Jesus was raised from the dead is because he was slain for sins and if he was actually slain for sins it means he was the Christ and if he was the Christ he was the one that all the Bible including the Old Testament hundreds even thousands of years beforehand pointed to him and predicted that he would come and so if the scriptures predicted a Christ if a Christ came that Christ then died for sins and then the evidence that that death for sins was accepted by God he was raised from the dead if the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened it's all true he's absolutely right he's absolutely right the Christian has the hope that not only is the resurrection undeniable all the Bible is trustworthy because of it Unfortunately, then, he said this. He said, but I won't believe it because I don't want it to be true. Because if Jesus is raised, he's also Lord, and I don't want it to be true. I hope that's not you today. I hope it's not you. I hope you understand, though, the, 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 un, the good reasoning, the good understanding that if Jesus is raised from the dead, it's all true. The Bible's trustworthy. The second hope is this. The resurrection gives you hope that a fresh start or a new beginning is only a prayer away. This is so precious to me. I hope this is precious to you as well. This is so precious to anyone who in their life loves to serve and to minister to people. A fresh start, a new beginning is just one act of humility away always you see not only do christians believe that their savior is risen they also believe that their savior is the one who was god himself eternally god who came down to rescue fallen people he came down to enter into the brokenness the pain of this world to identify with sinners. And the way he identifies with sinners is not by committing sin. The Bible's clear about that. The writer of Hebrews said he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. He doesn't identify with sinners by committing with sin, by committing sin. He identifies with sinners by becoming sin. Meaning that the guilt of sin, the penalty for sin, the wrath of God for sin was put on him when he went to the cross on that Friday. That's why it was so hideous. That's why it was so terrible. There he gave himself as the wrath-appeasing sacrifice for the sins of the world. Not only was he raised, but we also believe that he's the one that came down to rescue fallen people. And listen, the forgiveness that he provides, remember Luke said, to go and to preach this message for the forgiveness of sins. 
the forgiveness that he provides that we all need for a new beginning, a fresh start is always near. It's just one act of humility away. It's just one prayer away. If we confess our sins, the Bible says, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a Christ. What a beauty. What a joy. What a hope every Christian has. And the Bible is full of examples of people whose cases seemed hopeless until Jesus entered the picture. I think about that man often that Luke talks about, Luke chapter 8. He's a man who was possessed by demons, so many that he even says that he's possessed by a legion of demons. We don't know for sure how many that is, a hundred, a thousand, I don't know, but I tell you this, one's enough. (laughs) And he's possessed by a legion of demons. And Luke says this about him. He was so out of control that nothing could be done to help him. The people had tried. They'd even gone as far as trying to chain him. But he was so out of control, he would break the chains. And he would run crazy throughout the village. He would sleep out in the tomb, out in the tombs. And he was an absolute crazy man. And then Luke says this detail. He was like this a long time time a long time you say I've been the way I've been for a long time so would he a long time Luke says he'd been this way and then Jesus came into his life and Jesus showing his authority and power over all things even over demonic demonic powers delivered him from his oppression says he was clothed and in his right mind. The power of Jesus. I think about Mary Magdalene. We read about her this morning. Mary came to that tomb on the third day. Mary, earlier in the gospel, says that, that she was possessed by seven demons. Seven was the number that was used to show completeness. She's completely possessed. But Jesus delivered her. And that just gives me such hope. It gives me such hope to know that a fresh start, a new beginning for anyone is just one act of humility away. It's one act of prayer away. Whether you know the Lord as your Savior or not, anyone this morning, no matter matter what direction your life is going, Christians always have hope for a new beginning and fresh start because the tomb is empty. Rejoice in that today. Going along with that, the resurrection gives hope that you can change and grow. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in work, is at work in you who believe. Leo read that this morning from Ephesians 1. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The resurrection of Christ is God's promise to you that change is possible. What great hope that is. But let's revel in this one, number four this morning. The resurrection gives you hope that Jesus will make all things new. Stop and think about it. This is one of of the great joys that the fact that Jesus' resurrection was real and bodily gives us. Because the redemption ultimately that Jesus will bring to this earth. On the way to, uh, to church this morning, I had the radio on, and I learned tomorrow was Earth Day. And, and uh, th- that's fine for everyone. We all should care about the environment and so forth and so on and be good stewards of this earth. But let me tell you, there's only one healer of this planet, and his name is Jesus. And the Bible even tells us that this whole world is groaning. It's groaning because of the effects of sin and the curse that's on it. But one day Jesus will really, actually, literally obliterate that curse. And he will bring healing to this earth. He will bring healing to the world. He will restore it. Just like he will heal and restore his people and redeem them perfectly, he will heal and restore all things. Listen, that's not just a dream. 
That's not just a myth. That's not just an emotional construct. That is the real, actual truth. And as true and undeniably as he was risen, bodily, physically, the redemption that is coming to the world will be a real, actual, literal redemption. And that's what all of our hopes long for. Let me just read it for you. This is the end of the book, Revelation 21. The Apostle John in Revelation 21 received this revelation from the Lord. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. That's King Jesus. Verse 4, listen to these precious words. This is the Christian's hope that he will make all things new. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. What a glorious hope that is. That is the ultimate redemption of all things. And that is the hope of every believer. Jesus will make all things new, literally. We praise him for that. Number five, the resurrection gives you the hope of eternal life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, unless we live till the coming of Jesus, we'll, we'll, we'll die physically. He who believes in me, though he die, Yet shall he live. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, the scripture says. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Jesus is the eternal Son of God, and he came to this earth to live a perfect life. And not only living that perfect life did he please God in every way, his Father, but he also then could be a perfect sinless sacrifice to die in our place on the cross, to take the wrath of God and remove it from those who would repent and believe in him. And that is the hope of the gospel. And those who believe, Jesus says, will have eternal life. Eternal life. I heard somebody describe it this way. They said the great day of resurrection when all of God's people are resurrected to eternal life, must be like waking up from a bad dream. We've all experienced that, haven't we? You know when you have a bad dream, it is so real. Whatever it is that's chasing you, whatever it is that's gnawing on your leg, <laughs> whatever height that you're falling from, it is so real. And you might even wake up with your heart pounding and you're sweating and you're you're terrified because it seems so real. But then you know what it's like when you start going, wait a minute. It was just a dream. I'm not being eaten by a lion. I'm not falling off a cliff. It's just a dream. It's like in a moment, it all became untrue. And as we live this life, and I'm not trying to say this life isn't real, but I am saying this, there are some things in this life that seem ultimate, like an empty grave, like the words from your doctor, you have cancer, or the words from someone to say, I'm leaving. There's so much in this world that's just like that terrifying dream. It seems so ultimate. But listen, Jesus defeated death. It's not ultimate. And one day in the resurrection of the righteous, it will all become untrue. 
and we will be with him eternally, forever, with all of his people. And he will make all things new, and that is our hope today. Or maybe it's best said like this. This morning I met a young family coming to church. They have a little daughter. I'm not real good at guessing these ages. I'm going to guess she's four, five, maybe something like that. She's all dressed up in her beautiful Easter dress. And this morning she said to her dad, she said, Dad, Daddy, I have good news and bad news. He said, well, what's the good news? Jesus is alive. Amen, that's good news. He said, what's the bad news? She said, I forget. (laughs) Amen. Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty, and it changes everything.